Hello and welcome to the Global View on this Wednesday. I'm Andrew Gagan. Good to have you with us here at Ausbiz. Let's first check what uh, we saw overnight. Global equity markets turning negative while oil prices slid on weakening demand. Both the Dow and S&P 500 lost momentum, having closed at record highs the previous session. And a weak sales forecast from chipmaker ASML weighed on tech shares, sending the Nasdaq lower. And ASML's US listed shares plummeted while the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index fell around 5%. Apple bucked the trend with its shares rising to a new record high as smartphone shipment data saw a boost in the third quarter helped by the launch of its iPhone 16. And the energy sector came under heavy selling pressure as crude prices fell on weaker demand expectations and on reports that Israel is unlikely to strike Iranian oil infrastructure. On the earnings front, Bank of America rose following a third quarter profit beat, while Charles Schwab shares soared after beating estimates. However, Citigroup shares were down after its results. Shares of United Health slumped after the health insurer forecast profit below estimates, and Walgreens Boots Alliance soared after narrowly beating estimates for fourth quarter adjusted profit and announcing plans to shut 1,200 stores to cut costs. Well, the New York Fed's monthly gauge of factory activity in the state has turned negative and fallen to a five-month low, indicating contraction in the sector, while the New York Fed Consumer Inflation Expectations Survey saw the one-year measure unchanged at 3%. And San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly has expressed optimism that the current economic expansion could remain on track, saying, we've already seen some of the same patterns play out in our current expansion. Labor force participation for prime age workers has reached new highs. Compared to recent history, the current expansion is still relatively young. U.S. Treasury yields, they've eased the 10-year down to 4.03%. The two-year little changed at 3.98%. And the U.S. dollar edged higher against most major currencies. The Aussie falling to 67 U.S. cents. We're just taking a look at what happened in commodities overnight. As mentioned, their oil prices tumbling to a near two-week low on a weaker demand outlook and on reports that Israel will not strike Iranian nuclear and oil facilities, easing concerns of a supply disruption. Brent crude futures down more than 4% at $74 a barrel. Metal prices are down across the board, copper off by 1.5%. Iron ore has fallen around 1% to $106 US dollars a tonne. And gold has been boosted by those falling bond yields. Spot gold climbing to 266 one, uh, 260 $2,661 an ounce, I'll get there. Uh, Bitcoin has continued to strengthen to around 66500 US dollars. Well, Nathaniel Hyde is portfolio manager at in, uh, Insight Investment. He gives us his outlook for global growth and inflation and the opportunities in fixed income. As we think about the global economic outlook, I think it's really important that we consider it in the context of the nearly unprecedented synchronization of global economic and monetary policy cycles that we saw as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, COVID hit everyone hard, it hit everyone fast, and it prompted roughly the same policy response around the globe. Easier or expansionary fiscal policy and looser monetary policy. You know, three years later, four years later, we're finally starting to see more differentiated economic and monetary policy cycles. And that's particularly the case within the developed markets over the last six to nine months or so. Um, you know, one hand, on one hand, kind of going their own way, you have the Bank of Japan, and they're really unique among the developed markets in that they're moving towards tighter monetary policy. Kind of at the other end of the spectrum, you have the Bank of Canada or Canada, where a percent and a half increase in the unemployment rate has seen the Bank of Canada consistently surprise the market to the dovish side. And then somewhere in the middle, you have the U.S. and Europe. The U.S., a modestly softening growth outlook, ongoing downtrend in inflation, combined with the loosening that we've seen in the labor market left the Fed in a place where it was comfortable to ease 50 basis points uh, at their most recent meeting, kicking off their easing cycle. And we expect, you know, ongoing easing to come. And then in Europe, a little bit different, uh, where the ECB with their single mandate and their kind of exclusive goal of maintaining price stability, uh, they've been a little more reluctant to ease as core inflation has remained relatively high as 
a high level of unionization has seen services inflation remain relatively elevated despite what are very what have been very weak growth outcomes and a growth outlook that's really not much better. Um, so I would say it's really the first time in a long time that we've seen significant separation between in economic performance between the developed markets. Um, and that's really created a much more interesting environment for investing that allows for a lot of opportunities. So Nathaniel, maybe let's just put Japan aside for one moment, but taking a look at expectations for uh, central bank monetary policy in the year ahead. Where are you seeing that tracking, I guess, particularly with a focus on Europe and also the US? So at this point, I, the feels like the market has it about right. Um, you know, we were certainly looking a little rich in the middle of last month when we uh, towards the tail end of that big rally. Um, but with the sell off that we've seen over the past three or four weeks, we think the market has it about right. Um, at the margin, you know, we think easing is likely to be delivered a little bit quicker than is currently implied by market pricing in the U.S. and probably a little bit slower in Europe. But you certainly can't say that the market is stretched or significantly misvalued in either direction. As you move a little further out the curve, uh, that's where it gets a little more interesting. Um, we're generally of the view that R star did not sh has not shifted significantly higher um, in the years following the pandemic, and as a result, we think the terminal rates uh, implied by current market pricing are probably on the high side. Now, it's difficult to say when that kind of more strategic or longer term value is going to be realized, but we do have a relatively high level of confidence that over time we should see those terminal rates drop and uh, yield curves shift lower. So Nathaniel, given the global easing cycle is now underway, what is your view just as far as fixed income is concerned? Where are you seeing those opportunities right now? So we're generally pretty constructive on the outlook for fixed income uh, and do expect global interest rates to trend lower over time. Um, you know, I mentioned the recent sell-off um, has returned yields to what we think are much more attractive levels, particularly in the context of downside risk to our economic outlook. And that's particularly the case in the US where the sell-off has been the most pronounced. So I would say that's a, that's a market where we're more constructive on duration. Other markets where we uh, think yields are likely to trend lower, um, New Zealand most notably, uh, where we've seen a really pronounced deceleration in economic activity over the past uh, couple of quarters. And then to a lesser extent, um, select emerging markets, places like South Korea, um, where the demographic profile and the uh, distribution of debt within that economy is such that, you know, tighter monetary policy is almost impossible to, to deliver without rushing growth. So we we're a little more constructive in markets like the US, New Zealand, and Korea, and we are a little more bearish on the outlook for duration in places like Canada, and particularly in somewhere like Japan. What of Australia? What's your view there, I guess, particularly given that uh, there's no prospect of any rate cuts here, uh, possibly until early next year? So Australia is an interesting one. Um, Australia has a relatively high uh, R star neutral rate uh, as a result of its uh, high population growth. Um, the estimates are around three and a half percent for a nominal rate. And the RBA only really got up to about four and a quarter when it hiked rates. So if you think about that, policy was only about 75 basis points into restrictive territory in Australia. And that contrasts with somewhere like the US where most estimates have policy rate about 200 basis points getting to about 200 basis points above neutral. So while Australia, due to the structure of its mortgage market, is generally going to exhibit a relatively high level of sensitivity to changes in monetary policy, the fact that policy never got all that tight means 
that growth never really slowed all that much and inflation never came down all that much. So that's really left the RBA as kind of a notable laggard among its developed market peers during this easing cycle. And Nathaniel, a lot of focus, of course, on China at the moment, given it has unveiled some policy stimulus, although more recently, I guess it has underwhelmed markets, but there's a lot of expectations built in there. How are you viewing what you're seeing in terms of uh, what Beijing has unveiled thus far? So we have been fairly concerned for some time now about the structural outlook for the Chinese economy. And unfortunately, we're not really seeing anything in recent policy announcements that's likely to change that. Um, you know, there's still significant structural issues in the residential property market, and that's really acting as a drag on not only household balance sheets, but also consumer confidence. Uh, so that's domestic demand is really quite weak in China and is likely to remain so despite recently announced policy measures. The external sector has been doing a little bit better recently as policymakers have really tried to support exporters and in an effort to piggyback on a favorable global growth environment. Unfortunately, uh, policymakers in the West have really started to wise up to that game and given the number of tariffs that have recently been put in place on Chinese goods and frankly the likelihood that more are coming, it's not clear that Chinese policymakers are going to be able to lean on the export sector as a driver of growth going forward. So while recent policy measures are helpful in the near term, no question about that. You know, we revised up our 2024 growth forecast just recently by a little over half a percent. Uh, it's not really addressing the structural issues that are facing the economy. And we continue to expect that policy stimulus from uh, Chinese officials is really going to be delivered on an ad hoc basis and designed more to manage the pace at which economic growth decelerates than to really boost growth higher. Nathaniel Hyde from Insight Investment. All right, let's uh, check where we're likely to get going in just a couple of minutes. So you can see SPY futures are down almost four tenths of a percent. So looking to retrace some of those sizable gains we had on the equity market yesterday. Stay with us because the opening is just a couple of minutes away.